He said, Amen. Amen. Matthew 16. Now I'm going to take you through some journey. And um, you know, I'm a very slow talker. So, it doesn't seem like you believe that, right? <laughs> so, by Monday morning, we'll get somewhere. Matthew 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, others, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then he said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, my father. Let me quickly say this. Now, there are two words for blessed in the New Testament precisely. And the word hilogio and the word makairos. One of them means to be fortunate. The other one means to be spoken well of. Just two words. Now, there's not one instance where those words were used for material possession or human achievement. Not once. Whether it is the one that is used for fortunate or the other one that means to speak well of. Not once. Not once. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't use it, but when we're using it, we're not speaking Bible language. You know, you can say, I was blessed with a, a, a baby boy, something like that. I was blessed with a brand new car. I was blessed with, it's a good English word, but it's not a Bible word. Because the word blessed from Genesis has to do with God's plan. When God, the first time we hear God blessed man, Genesis 1, 27, 28, he blessed man, said be fruitful, um, replenish, you know, have dominion, subdue, fill the earth. It had to do with God's resting place. It had nothing to do with material possession. That's the first time you hear the word blessed. Now you now understand why the word cursed will mean to be out of God's plan. The first person we saw who was cursed was Cain. And what was the point? He was cast out of God's presence. So blessed means you are in his plan. Cursed means you are out of his plan. So it has nothing to do. Now, it's not wrong to say, I don't expect you now to say, I won't use, I was blessed with a cow. You'll say, I was possessed with a cow. No, no, you don't have to do that. There are some words that are English and stick to that. But when you are talking Bible, which is when you are talking Bible language, you must use Bible words. So blessed has to do with God's plan. You are blessed means you are welcome. You are accepted into something. Is that clear? So, blessed are thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood are returned to my fathers in heaven. Then says in 18, And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now notice that in verse 17, Jesus says the Father which is in heaven. Then in 19, I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So there's a repetition there. Whatever you bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So, there the, the was in there that needs clarification. But before we go in there, you know, last night, I said to us that the method, or let's say the, 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 the method, theology, whatever, that, you know, makes the Bible two compartments. You have the Old Testament, 39 books. Then you have the New Testament, 27. And, and, and it segregates your thinking of the word. And where we assume, for example, that the Old Testament is a past tense of the scripture. That, that's the idea we have many times. But that's not true. Because those who wrote the New Testament wrote the New Testament from the Old Testament. Now, I believe you know when I say Old and New Testament, I'm not referring to the Word of God being called Old or New. I'm referring to the books of the Bible as the translators have put them. Because nobody in the New Testament books, as we call them today, none of them refer to the books of Genesis to Malachi as Old Testament. Not one person did. It's never called Old Testament. The words used for it 
For example, Matthew 5, 17 and 18 is called the law. And law doesn't mean legalism. Law means doctrine. The law and the prophets. It's also called the scriptures. In John 10, 34, 35, Jesus calls it the word of God. To whom the word of God came. He calls it the word of God. It's not never called Old Testament. And that's very important because it's sometimes, or many times, it has compromised our level of understanding. It's not called Old Testament. It's called the scriptures. Which means that we need to also understand that Jesus never taught from the epistle. Never did. Let me say one more that may, <laughs> may get your attention. Even Paul and Peter never taught from the epistle. They didn't get the epistle and say, okay, guys, we're going to study today the book of Romans. They never did that. They say, okay, guys, you know what? We're going to do the book of 1 Corinthians today. We're going to... No, no, no. Because the scriptures to them was Genesis to Malachi. That's what they taught from. They never taught from the, even the books we call the New Testament. Today. They didn't teach from them. So therefore, we must find the connection. What's the connection between the Old and New Testament books? Don't forget, Old and New Testament books is not the mind of the authors. That's the mind of the translators, or let's say the translation that you're using. Okay? So that's important. The writers of the New Testament, don't forget New Testament is just a phrase. They assume something. And I've said that to you many times. They assume that you are reading the Old Testament. They have that assumption. It's like if you go to a, a, a law faculty class and then it's a 500 level faculty of law and I think in 500 level we do company law and all that. That lecturer who is taking the company law as a fifth year course will assume that you, you pass through level one, level two, level three, four. So there are certain things he will assume you know because you've read. You genuinely, you know, nobody can start from level five. So he will assume that you know it. And then he also has an assumption that you went through secondary school. Not that you were a miracle conception that showed up in the first year in university. You will assume that you... So the assumptions that they will make, even in writing. So the writers of the New Testament make an assumption. That assumption is, pay good attention, that you are reading the Old Testament. So, because they know, or they assume you read the Old Testament, they will not quote the Old Testament wholesale. Now, this is a problem because, and I'm going to talk about this this morning, pay very good attention. There is an idea that we're going to correct again and again, that the Old Testament, and you know, the dangerous part is that by the time you look at some Bibles, they have references. And I know some Bibles they have referenced. Some even have uh, like some pages where they say uh, uh, prophecies of the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. So you assume that the, new, the use of the Old Testament is for prophecies. So you selectively read it. Because in your mind, it's selectively done. And I'll tell you what I mean. If you see some Bible translations, and I've argued against this in Fora, you now find, um, they put, maybe you have uh, John, no, no, maybe you have uh, Matthew, uh, sorry, maybe Romans 1.1. 1, 1. So you now have a center chain reference. Then now says, you now takes a verse, just one verse from maybe Isaiah. So you assume that all that the writer did was to take a text from the Old Testament and, you know, that text is now fulfilled in Romans 1.1. 1, 1. No. The first thing you need to realize is that not Paul, not Peter, not James, not John, <clears throat> not any writer of the Synoptic and John did those references. 
always know the words that didn't come from the original writers. For example, the use of chapters and verses did not come from the original writers. They didn't. The structure we have today, which is uh, chapters, verses, and all that, didn't come from them. So if it's not there in their mind, it shouldn't be in your interpretation. Now, we could use it for references, but it is not meant to be, it's not meant to be in the interpretation. So they have that assumption. So when the man is speaking in the fifth year in the university, faculty of law, then he says, now he mentions a case. Okay? He talks about an opinion. Then he says, C N W L R. Then he mentions Coyote versus John. Then somebody beside you in the class will now ask you, please, who is Coyote in this class? Now, if you're a lawyer, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you're you are wondering where did I get this kind of funny example. Say, Coyote, say, I'm the one. I say, are you joking? No, I just want to, I'm sincere. I just want to know. NWLR, is that Nigerian Wrestling League? Sorry. Were you kidnapped into this class? Because you should know those simple things from your first year. So the writers of the New Testament are going to make that assumption that you have in your hands. Paul is not thinking, because hear what I'm about to say. When Paul wrote his letters, he didn't know you were going to read them. So, that's very important. So when you say, the New Testament written to us, are you in Corinth? No, not me. You can even be in Corinth now. Were you in Corinth then? You know, so really, the audience, the question is, what did the audience read? The audience, for example, in Rome, I'm not sure they read the letter to Galatia. I'm sure the guys in Galatia, I'm not sure they read the one to Corinth. But one thing we know they read is that they read the Old Testament. That was the word of God. And that is still the word of God. Can I have an amen? That was what they read. So which means the context of what we call the epistles, the New Testament, will be the books that the audience read. So the proper context of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, cannot be the book of Ephesians. It has to be where the writer is teaching from. Who's following what I'm saying this morning? Let me see you, come on. That's where the writer is teaching. That's the context. That's where the context is. So when we find Jesus saying, Blessed are thou, Simon Bajona, Bajo, for flesh and blood, for my father in heaven. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. When he said that, what did his audience read? What were they reading? What was available to Peter, James, no, John, Peter, John, Matthew, Thomas, Judas, at least? What was available to them wasn't the epistle. Wasn't even the four Gospels. What were they? Because, you see, in Bible teaching and understanding and interpretation, you cannot override what the audience heard. The first audience, what did they hear? What did they read? That's very important. So, we must therefore find that connection. What is the connection? It's the word of God. It's the word of God to them. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, Matthew says, the book of the genealogy or generation, which was Genesis, of Jesus Christ, the son of a David, the son of Abraham. Why? Because Matthew wants you to learn about Abraham. He wants you to learn about David. You can't know who Jesus is without knowing who Abraham is and who David is. Because when he says the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, there is, a, there is a meaning to that phrase. Seed of Abraham, seed of David. In Mark's gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
right? It, as is written in the prophets. Then he goes to Isaiah and he goes to Malachi, which means to know who Jesus is, you need to read Isaiah and read Malachi. In Luke 24 and 25, upon his resurrection, Luke records that Jesus said, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ have suffered this is entered to his glory. Beginning at Moses and all the scriptures, he interpreted, he expounded to them in all, another prophet, sorry, he interpreted in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Later on in 44, he said to them, these are the words which I spake to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. The 45, Luke 24, he opened e their understanding that they might understand the scripture. So therefore, hear this well, the Old Testament, don't forget I call it Old Testament because that's what is in your Bible. Right? The Old Testament sheds light on the New Testament. You will need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. Are you in church? Are you in church? You need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. So, very badly. Why then is the New Testament seemingly just making reference? Now imagine if I, this is how I explain this. Imagine if I have a book. The book had been written and it's about 500 pages. And you have the book. So I want to explain the book to you. Then I start to quote the book, right? I quote all, every time I want to explain anything, I quote the whole 500 pages. How would that sound? That's not intelligent. All I need to do is to make connection to that 500 page book. It's very likely that the book I'm going to write after will be smaller. Not because what I'm saying is shorter or smaller or brief. It's because you have the book I'm teaching from. So you have 39 books, then you have 27 books. In the 27 books, don't forget, each of the books stands on its own. Corinth didn't read Galatia. Galatia didn't read Philippi. No. They all read the Old Testament. So I, I like to say it like this. What is common to all the epistles is the Old Testament. You need the Old Testament to understand what is written in the New Testament. Why? Because that is the context. That's the context. So context is not the verse before. The verse. Who even made it verses for you? The verse before, the verse after. Read the, you know, and they say, uh, read the verse before it. Read the verse after it. That's the meaning. And Paul says, excuse me, I didn't put them in verses. I know, I know. I have a great time information, you know. No, no. The context will be the Old Testament. Because the context has to be what the audience understood. What they read. And you see, this disconnection, right? And, and, and again, let, let's do this. Even the, the four Gospels. Many, much of the theology we have today, and I'm saying that confident because I know, uses the four Gospels just for one thing. Jesus Christ came. Then he died. So the four Gospels are just useful for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But there are other things happening. They say, yeah, yeah, they're not really important. Um, you know, not so important. Um, you know, not so, not really. Uh, and, and, and sometimes you say that when you hear Jesus teach something, you say, it's not for us. So it's for who? It's for the Old Testament people. So which one is for us? Well, um, the one that he said when he rose from the dead. What did he say? You barely have four verses. Luke 24, 25, 27, full stop. What did he say? Things concerning himself. What are the things? Luke 24, 44, and 45. You know, so far, you, 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 have, you, you have, Jesus said something. Someone said, it's not for us. 
that what is important for us are the things he said when he rose from the dead. So why did he spend hours? Sometimes the things he said that people dis- discard are things he said just a week to his death. And he taught them exhaustively. But he then said, guys, guys, you know what I'm teaching now is not by next week going to expire. Quickly use it now. You have one week to use this tree. One week, just one week. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Because Jesus never said so. So, don't forget, the context of the Old Testament, I'm sorry, the New Testament words will be the Old Testament. So we said, why then are they brief? So we came up with the concept of the codified language. What is the codified language? The codified language is when a book is teaching another book that had been written earlier, rather than quote all its contents, it uses short phrases, terminologies, sentences, that will summarize a whole book, books, a whole world, events, personalities. Because the writer of the book in the codified language expects you to go to the books that he's referring to. Not to quote verses out of it, because they were not in verses, but to read the entire book. So every time I read the New Testament, it points me back to the Old Testament. Every time I do it, it points me back to the Old Testament. So they have the assumption. The assumption is you are reading the Old Testament. So therefore, we came up with this. I'll just go over it again. These principles of interpreting a Bible text. The first thing I say is, see the entire Bible as a single text. Now, broken into subtext. So, the whole Bible as a singular text. The whole Bible. Okay? So, because of that, read the read Bible text like a conversation. And sometimes, you will see the conversation is between Paul and Isaiah. Sometimes, the conversation is between Abraham and Peter. Just like... Jesus' words were always conversations between him and 39 books. So read it in a conversation. So for example, I can read something in Colossians and know that the beginning of this statement is somewhere in the book of Psalms. So I read it as a conversation, an ongoing conversation, a progressive conversation. That's the first thing. The second thing is, look at the grammatical structure. Now, this is really for your teaching. In your understanding the scripture, you do it oftentimes, oftentimes, do this oftentimes, often, sorry. Look out for similar things. Similar. Now, that's what the people who put it in chapters and verses try to do. They try to you know, put things together, 1 Corinthians 12 together, 1 Corinthians 13 together, 1 Corinthians 11 together, and all that. Now, in your study, you are not bound to stick to that. You are bound to use it for references, but you are not bound to stick to it because the chapters and verses did not come from the authors. So I say often, find the structure that brings a better understanding to your audience. Is that very clear? Is that very clear? Number three. Number three is the grammar. The words are not as English as you think. The words are not as English as you think. For example, we sang the song this morning, Church of the Firstborn. I I heard a preacher once say, uh, he said, uh, Jesus is the firstborn. And he's honest. He said, Jesus is the firstborn. He said, you know how many bonds have come out? He said, you and I can be the 500 million bonds. (laughs) <laughs> that's not too nice. But that's because he felt firstborn his first son. But God called an entire nation, my son, my firstborn, an entire nation. 
So that should show you that firstborn is an office. It's an office. Exodus 4, 22, 23. Firstborn is an office. So every time the right of the firstborn, which moved I, I, rather from Cain, it went to Abel. Right of the firstborn. Instead of Ishmael, it went to Isaac. Instead of Esau, it went to Jacob. Instead of Reuben, it went to Joseph. You notice that all those who occupied that firstborn office had visions and revelations. Knew about God's purpose and plan. So firstborn is an office. So when we are called the church of the firstborn, firstborn is our function. Hallelujah. Is that very clear? So it's not as English, just like the word son of God is not male child of God. It's not as English as we think. No, it's not. And that's why a good student of Scripture must have a concordance. Now, I'm not too comfortable with dictionaries, but it's okay if you have one. A concordance. You have to have it. You know the reason? Because it's not in your language. You have to have it. And there are times the trans. Now, I'm into Bible translation. I know it's not easy, so I'm not going to condemn anyone. But many times, there are oversight in translation. So you have to check and double check and sometimes triple check. So, have a concordance. A Bible concordance. And they're very good ones that will let you see the meaning because the words are not as English as you think. We're going to look at one in a, just in a moment. They are not as English as they sound. What has happened over years is that we have turned, put this down if you're writing, you should. We have turned all Bible writers into speakers of English. It's a miracle. We have literally put English words, sometimes even slangs, in the mouth of Paul. But they never spoke in English. No. You know why? Because the English language was not even available. So, some say, but, but you know, in some guys, they, 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 they argue. They say, well, I don't believe in all this Greek and Hebrew stuff. And, and some guys, they mock it. I, I saw a preacher speaking, speaking in a conference. And that conference had a lot of people. And he said, don't mind all these Greek and Hebrew people. They'll just be talking logos. They don't have rhema. Is that not why you should have understood it? That phrase shows how illiterate he is. So they know the spirit. They don't know the. They don't know the. They don't know the spirit. You know, very ridiculous. And I, I shook my head. I pitied the congregation, and they were all laughing, just like you laughed. <laughs> and you know, the minute they are laughing, they know the people that are in their minds. You know. I've sat down somewhere, this was in the 90s, and somebody was speaking. He said, me, I don't talk all this grammar, all this context, Greek, and, and everybody knew he was talking about me. And I was looking. And I was meant to speak. He said, we, we give you the heart of God direct. We, we tell you the mind of God straight. So, <laughs> it was my time to speak. I deliberately. That the Greek meaning. You know, what didn't matter? D. The Greek meaning of D. What was D? <laughs> you cannot harass me. Ignorance cannot harass light. It's, it's abominable. You are the lazy one. You are the one who is lazy. See how many things I've written now to teach. See how many things you will now come with your Bible alone and a small one. You just be quoting from your head. Don't be saying, I tell you today. Today. <laughs> today. <laughs> it's your hour. Someone said, I am the Zerubbabel of my generation. Where did you hear that from? <laughs> you know, and they say, no, it's not a Greek and Hebrew. 
The fellow told me, he said, I, I don't believe in all this Greek. I, I want the language of the Holy Ghost. I said, okay. And he's, what is called language of the Holy Ghost is English. English is the language of the Holy Ghost. So I said, okay. Um, can I explain something here? Yes. And now, um, you know, I'm an manageable boy. I'm, I don't speak. I don't speak French. I was taught by Phil. I failed to even listen. So all I know now is la pele, la pele. I don't know what it is. I said, imagine <laughs> if, you know, I want to inspire somebody who doesn't speak English to write in English and he speaks French. Is it possible? He said, it's not possible. What language would I use? said, you use the French language that you understand. Excellent. I said, if he doesn't know English, he can't write in English. Say yes. And the moment you can't speak a language, you can't understand the language. Or let's say you can't understand the culture. I told you culture comes before language. For every language, there's a cultural context. So, I said, I said, so, if there was no English language until about a thousand years ago, and all we had was Hebrew in the Old Testament, what language would God use to inspire the writer? The Hebrew. Good. I said, in the New Testament, if the language of the audience and the speakers was Greek, what language would the Holy Ghost use? said, Greek. That's very good. So the Holy Spirit inspired the writers to write in what language? Hebrew and Greek. So I said, what is the language of the Holy Ghost? Hebrew and Greek. Thank you very much. You know, people just say things. Just say you are lazy. You have to find out what's the language. And you notice that the teachers of scripture, including Jesus, were doing translation of languages. I'll show you two places. Nehemiah chapter 8. So, don't forget. Don't make the writers of the Bible English. They were not English. And they were not Ijebu. No, 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 no. No, no, they were not. Let me look for controversy. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Are you in church? Nehemiah. Some people are wondering where Nehemiah is. See where the problem is? If I said efficient, you'll have gone there. If I said Nehemiah, you're using style to look like you're not opening to check. I was like, ah, this is king. Where is it? If I said go to Micah, ah, Micah. Is that a short form of Malachi? No. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 8. Look at this, verse 7. And also Jeshua. And Bani, and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shebathiah, and all of that. Let's just go. <laughs> Brother Higgin will say tongue twisting names. Cause the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. Let's take it together. They read in the book, in the law of God, distinctly and gave sense and caused them to understand the religion. That means they were translating the word. They were translating the word. They caused them to understand it. Look at Luke 23. This was right on the cross of Christ. And verse 38. A superscription also was written over him in letters of what? Luke 23, 38, are you there? Let's go. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of what? Greek, Latin, Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Why? Because those were three languages spoken. The times also he spoke in Arabic. So, it means that those who taught, including Jesus, they spend time to interpret words. 
The words are not as English as we assume. No, they are not. So we said, number three, what's the grammar? Number four, what text is that text interpreting? Now, usually, if you are reading the New Testament, you will go back to the Old Testament because we have said it, that the Old Testament is the context of the New Testament. Let this sink so well. The New Testament explains the Old Testament, while the Old Testament sheds light on the New Testament. So, find out the text. And how do you do it? You know, I've said to you before, when you hear the Bible says, the Bible says it's not quoting one verse of the Bible. The Bible says it's reading 66 books on a subject matter. Then you come to the conclusion of what the Bible says. Now, I've seen some have become so careless. And, you know, that's the thing about being a, 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 a quick person to teach. As I'm speaking now, some people are forming salmon notes that I understand it. Some say, ah, that's it. I had this one on Sunday. I once did that one day. That must be 95. I went to a service in the morning. Then our ministry used to meet in the evening. So I went for this service. And the man of God explained something. I liked it. I really liked it. I was like, wow. So in the evening, I was teaching a series then. Now are we the sons of God? This thing that the man of God said in the morning has no relationship, whether in law or relative. They were not related by distant cousin. They were not related at all. But I told myself, I must preach this new one. Ah, ah. They used to call it the law of first young. Hear it from me first. So I got to, I was, I was talking now, sons of God, my text was first John 3. I was, so I just went into that text. Said, let me tell you something. Let me show you something very quickly. Hmm? So I shared that thing. And you know, I, I did the motion of the man of God said, glory. Everybody go, yeah. So I have excited, like I've dropped it. Yeah. I said something that will shake the heavens and the earth. So their sister, her name is Sister Kate. She's a pastor. Now, she came to meet me and she said, um, it was a very innocent question that if you said Jesus is the spirit did the spirit die and was buried I won't tell you what I said for you to get to that point so you know how horrible what I said was I said hey so I said to her I said I'm very sorry. I just heard it this morning. <laughs> it's not enough that I put. It has to be. <laughs> I said, no, 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 don't bother asking. Me too, didn't think. Thank you for thinking. And that sister is such a wonderful person. We went, went to a meeting together, and someone said that I was preaching. I said, the Bible says, the Father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, I didn't say the Son because there was no Jesus. So, she said, she was seated beside me. She said, so the Father of God. I said, you want them to bond you out of this program. Let's just act blessed and go. <laughs> the Father of who? <laughs> father of the Word. <laughs> you know, that's why it's good to teach people that can think, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> the father of who? <laughs> hmm. Everybody's already jumping. You're now asking questions. So that we can go home safe. Out of this week. So, you know, you have people, you pick up, they say, since Pastor has said that the Old Testament is the word of God, you now begin to hear new things. New, new thing. Well, you know, you say, ah, you know, the Red Sea is like chemistry 101. 
You have just gone to pick up and hold that bit. Bad habit. Pay attention. Hallelujah. Hope you are following what I'm saying. Don't start using Old Testament things. Don't say, uh, uh, this is the year of Micaiah. What's wrong with you? Relax. Still be teaching the one you were teaching before. Eh? Amen? Up of Jesus. God be with you. So, the, what text is it interpreting? So, you must know that the context of the New Testament is the Old Testament. And you're going to see how we've misread many things. So many things. You know, there's this teaching called election. Election. Predestination. And some people came up with that election is uh, predestination. Is God has said some people are going to hell, some are going to heaven, and God's predestined everybody. And he, he said, God has destined things to happen the way it must happen, and all that. So they have that concept that God determines everything. Even the thinking you are thinking, now, what is he thinking now? You're saying now is determining for you now. <laughs> there are some things God has determined. Some people will not live between 10 and 11, they'll just be moving. 10, 11. That one is determined. 10, 11. 10, 11. Very soon, 12. Number of disciples. 10, 11. 10, 11. 10, 11. 10. Think, see you people, eh? You use my words as prophecy for you. Ah! Jehovah God. The forgiveness is not on this earth. Let's go back to the word of God for now. You know, that God determines things. Now, when we did the teaching on Soul Grace Salvation, series four, what did we say there? That word predestination is not in the Hebrew language. If it was not in the Hebrew language, it's not possible to have been written by anybody. That God would determine things. All the actions of God in the Old Testament, none of them points to the fact that he determines things for everybody. None. Not even from Genesis 2. It's not in the language. And also, it's not also in the Greek language. So we found out it's a creation of the 15th and 16th century. Some guys will come today and say, hey, the people are no longer quoting the Bible, they are quoting church fathers. Church fathers, this was someone told me one time, 2011, he said, I have a book of 3,000 something by church fathers. I said, father of which church? The body of Christ. Go and sit down somewhere. Read the scripture. Let's take it on his own merit. So don't forget, the New Testament is always teaching the Old Testament. So the context of the New Testament is the old. Find the text it's interpreting. And that is not by using center chain reference. I remember one debate I had with a translator one day in, the, in, 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 in Hebrews 2, verse 6 and 7. They put in their reference Job. I think Job 5, 18 or something. And they said, what is man? You are mindful of him. The son of man that you visit him. Because it was very similar. And it's right there in the center reference. And I told the man, he was in the committee. I said, this is wrong. So we began the argument for over one week. So this is wrong. So how did we overcome it? We read the whole testament together and said it's not possible for it to have been referring to Job. It's the sound from Paul's earlier text, sorry, that of Hebrews, the earlier text in, in chapter 1 through chapter 2. It was clear that all in that particular, that all in that paragraph were from the sound. So that's why you have to do your job yourself. You have to read the Bible. Read it. Don't quote it. I said, the Bible is not for quoting. The Bible is for studying. It's not for quoting. Look for a verse and quote it. No. We're not told to quote the Bible. We're told to explain it. See that in a moment. 
So the fourth thing is what part of the Old Testament is explaining. We said number five. What was the theology in the first text, in the original text? What was the theology there? Oftentimes, it's still the same theology in the text that you're reading. Find out the theology. Number six. What is the New Testament explanation? Now, why do we say that? Because the New Testament is closer to our world than their world. What is the application? of the New Testament world. That is, the first century church. What was the application? Then number seven, how does it apply in today's world? Remember earlier I said, greet one another with the holy kiss. Now, there was a practice called the holy kiss. How did it apply? Because then, in the Greco-Roman world, they usually, and you know the Arabs still do it, they usually greet one another, you know, uh, in that world, using uh, the peck, not on the lips, but that's not in our culture. If you try it, say, I miss you. Well, say, What's wrong with your mouth? <laughs> so, now, we, we can bring that to our world and say, let's have a handshake, a hug, mild one, right? Not a beer hug. And we can say, how are you? Good morning. And we have done the word of God. So how does it apply? Now, the application in my world will also require the work of the Spirit to make the word of God that I learned to be applicable in my world. But listen to this. Usually, error starts when we want to start with number seven. Because many people just read the Bible for application. No, it's not forced for application. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, explanation, teaching. Then it says for persuasion. Then it says for correction. Then instruction in righteousness. So we must not start with application. The first thing is understanding. If you miss the original meaning of the text, if you miss the grammar, pay attention. If you miss the meaning of the text, if you miss the context, you can't get the application right. You can't get, a, you can't get the truth out of a lie. You can't get that. You can't get what is being said in your application if you never understood it. So therefore, like we said, the Old Testament, New Testament writer has an assumption that you are reading the New Testament. The eighth one, I added that one later on, is if there's any seeming contradiction, read the whole Bible again. Contradiction oftentimes exists in our mind, in our understanding. So, we mustn't make the error of reading the Bible carelessly. A good pastor will make you a serious student of the scriptures. I repeat myself. A good pastor will make you a serious student of the scriptures, which means you always read it all the time. Look at John 5. So, the assumption that the Old Testament is just a book of prophecy. Prophecy. Prophecies about Christ. You see that? Just about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That is not true. In John chapter 5 and verse 39. John 5 and 39. Such the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, notice what he's saying. He didn't say they are they that prophesize of me. No. It means the, the scriptures has my testimony. 
my evidence. He's not saying the Old Testament prophesies about me. That's not what he's saying here. He says, verse 40, you will not come to me that you may have life. Now look at 45. Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you. Even Moses in whom you trust. Now, this is in no way a contradiction of Moses. Now, I've seen some people do that. Say, oh, Moses is the one that accuses you. Jesus does not accuse you. No, no, no. That's not what he's saying. That's lifting the same out of context. He told you already that the scriptures has his evidence. Now, the word scriptures means what was written. Words that are written. Pay attention here. Then he says, there's one which accuses you, Moses in whom you trust. Now, Moses here stands for the scriptures. Now, the scriptures testify of him. So the question is, what did Moses in the scriptures accuse them of? The first thing is, do not forget, Moses never knew these people. So Moses could not accuse people that lived about 3,000 years after he did. So Jesus definitely is referring to the written word. That the written word has already accused you. Don't forget, the first thing, the written word bears my evidence. Secondly, the written word gives you life about me. Thirdly, the written word now accuses you. Now, accuses you of what? Accuses you of what? Pay attention here. John 5. He told them in verse 41, I, I see no order from men. 42, I know you. You have not the love of God in you. Okay? I'm calling my father's name. You receive me not. You don't believe so, he's saying to them that the scriptures has already addressed this unbelief of the testimony of God. So, what he's saying, in other words, is look, there's nothing new I'm saying to you. The scriptures already have spoken about your case. Hard-hearted, stiff neck. You don't have the love of God in you. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? He's not saying, I'm not come to accuse you. Moses is the one that accused No, 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 no. Rather, he is buttressing, validating what he's saying with what Moses had written. Now look at 46. Let's say 46 together. Let's go. I'll wait for you. Are you there? Let's go 46. For are you? Now stop there. Moses, personality or writings? Very well. So, let's change Moses to scriptures. Would it make sense? So, let's go. For do you believe the scriptures, you would have believed me. For the scriptures spoke about me. 47. If you believe not the scriptures, how shall you believe my word? It's not saying the scriptures prophesied. No. That means I am the God that Moses spoke about. Jesus is not talking about a prophecy here. He's talking about an evidence of his personality, his activity in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is not a book of prophecies. Do we have prophecies in the Old Testament? Oh, sure we do. But it is not a book of prophecy such that we go there to selectively pick, choose and pick. I don't like this one. I don't like how this one sounds. It can't be for me. It's not my portion. This is my portion. No, no, no. That's wrong reading of the scriptures. The scriptures, the Old Testament, they are about me. My activity, not a prophecy. If I listen, there was very little.
prediction in the writings of Moses. There was very little prediction in the writings of Moses. And, and I've said this before. You could put this down. I've explained this to you. Like, I think I did it last year. I did it also at the Believers Convention, of course, at the World Church's Conference. That when we talk about the prophecies about Christ, there's hardly a direct one. It's something we gather. You put things together to see it. There was not one person saying, Christ is going to come, so he's going to die for your sins. There was not one single person who said it. But according to the scriptures, we mean when we put everything together and we follow the pattern, I said to us that there's something called, pay attention, the, the, uh, the motif of scripture, which is an unspoken prophecy. A prophecy that is detected by patterns according to the scripture. This is the reason why the princes of this world did not know it. If the prophecies were straightforward as you are thinking, everybody would know it. But the things about the death of Christ, they were in patterns. You won't see a direct statement more often than not. There are few that are very likely, but you see, you won't find much prophecy as we think. So prophecies need not be utterances. A prophecy of scripture can just be a pattern. Cain was, I mean, Cain killed Abel. From that point, a pattern has been set between evil and good. Then Christ died for us. So from the activities of Abel and Cain, we see a prophecy. Without words spoken, a pattern. So don't expect to see right on their lips. We've done this study before, I don't want to go over it again. When Isaiah said, a, a, a woman shall conceive a, a virgin and bring forth a child, he wasn't talking about Jesus. In fact, if you take our teaching seated on high, and I think the, 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 the one on uh, So Great Salvation, the latest one, I explained that rather Isaiah was speaking from Samson, Gideon, and Isaac. He wasn't speaking for the future. The pattern came from Genesis through to the book of Judges. I explained that to us. So prophecy needs not be a verbal declaration. Many times it's a pattern that we can see within the scripture. Are you here? Are you still there? Very well. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, does this include the epistles? No, not immediately. It includes the epistles because the epistles agree with the scriptures. But when Paul wrote this, he was referring to Genesis through to Malachi, Romans 15. So, the scriptures, it didn't say all scriptures are given by the inspiration of God for prophecy about Christ. It didn't say that. For teaching. So, the Old Testament is meant for teaching. Not for quoting prophecies. Or selectively picking the text. If there's an area of the Old Testament that you don't like, that's your business. No, that's your business. You ought to understand it. That's your business. Don't say, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, uh, we, we get into this trouble. I told you, I personally told you this, and I've said it over time. That when we start defending the character of God, we get into trouble because oftentimes I had to step back myself about six years ago or so, seven years. I said, This doesn't look good because you will be made to deny the veracity and authority of the scriptures. Rather than discard the parts of scripture, why not understand it? Usually, it's a language issue, a context issue. Usually. And you see, I also found out God knows how to handle any mess that is found in. Just teach the word. Teach it 
grammatically, exegetically, exegetically, with the contextual meaning, present the truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. He says, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly divided the world truth. That's your job. God in his word will present himself. If you present him as the scriptures have put him. Is that very clear? Is that very clear? Very well. So the Old Testament is for teaching. Then it says, for reproof, which means to persuade. That's the Old Testament, right? Then it says, for correction and instruction in righteousness. There was no one who said the Old Testament is for prophecy. No. Romans chapter 15. Are you in church? Come on, guys, are you in church? Romans 15. And verse 3. Now, this is Paul. Talking about Christians walking in love, bearing with one another, aside from one. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, as is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Now, he goes directly to Psalm 69 verse 9. And he talks to us. Look at the next verse. Let's take four together. Let's go. Go, go again. Come on. Uh huh. We're written for, for what? The word "lend" here is doctrine. Let's take it again. Written for what? Our lend. Go on. That we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures. Is it for a prophecy? No. Because we say uh, everything is fulfilled in Christ. Thou shalt not convert is fulfilled in Christ. Thou shalt not commit adultery is fulfilled in Christ. How? No, 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 no. No, everything, all the things that, are, that they have been put on Jesus, it's all on Jesus. Thou shalt not steal is all on Jesus, so you are stealing for him. No, 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 no. That is rubbish reading. It's for our learning. So the scriptures, are for my learning. Look at, the, look at the epistle in 1 Corinthians 5 when a brother had his father's wife. Paul didn't say, according to Christ in the resurrection. That's not what he did though. In verse 13 he says, therefore, put away from among yourselves the wicked one, the wicked thing. That is Deuteronomy 13.5. He said, because we're going to see this. In God's holy land, and the holy land is the church. He said, when we have a wicked thing, we cast it out. We went to Jeremiah 13. When he was talking about supporting ministers of the gospel, he went to Deuteronomy again. How to care for ministers. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treasures the corn. So, they were not prophecies that have been fulfilled. No. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. We're going to choose. Who to replace Judas? They didn't say, you know, according to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. No. Acts 1.16. They said, men and brethren, the scriptures must not be fulfilled. Which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spoke concerning Judas. The question is, Judas, how did David know who Judas was? How would David speak about Judas? I told you. It's by the pattern, right? Judas will fit in. David never said, so Judas will betray Jesus, okay? Uh, then uh, he will take a muscle of, then he will go to that time, then, you know, guys, <laughs> don't worry. He's going to commit suicide, though. Does he hear the Lord? No! David spoke about those who betray the Lord already. So we already have the word of God about betrayal. So it becomes a prophecy to us. It's, we have the word of God about evil. We have the word of God about people who, are, who do injustice. So, the moment we see it in the word of God, it is by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 
So, look at the text. He went to David. Again in verse 20. The book of Psalms, let his happy children just let no man dwell therein. It's bishopric, let another take. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was given, Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. He said, God, how pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now watch this now. That scripture in Joel, pause, let, let's, let's think together. That scripture in Joel 2.28, has it been fulfilled? Huh? Uh-uh. It's still been fulfilled. We're supposed to act upon it. We saw it severally in the book of Acts. That is how the Old Testament is. It's the word of God. It's the plan of God. I usually say it like this. The Old Testament is the plan. The conception, the inception. The New Testament is the destination. I might change it next year. Is the truth. <laughs> so that's the, we've seen, this is the, and we know that Joel, hear this, Joel also had a reference point. Joel had heard and read that Moses said it. Joel knew of Isaiah. So there was no prophecy of the scriptures that was of any private interpretation. Everyone read into each other. Joel interpreting Isaiah, Isaiah interpreting David, David interpreting Moses. Everyone is interpreting one another. Who is a prophet of God is the one who by divine revelation interprets another prophet, another writer. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So, therefore, the scriptures, when given, the Old Testament is not about prophecies. Oh, it's a prophecy. So, it has been fulfilled in Christ. Jesus, also, you know what we say, every, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, everything in the Old Testament came to pass. What does that even mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? People have the idea that everybody in the Old Testament was looking forward to the, to the death of Christ. Abel, did he tell you? Noah, death of Christ, no. Abraham, death of Christ, no. If they were looking forward to it, why was everybody not surprised? No. That's not true. So we mustn't restrict the Old Testament to a book of prophecy. Rather, it's the light that we need to read the New Testament. Martin Luther said, the Old Testament is a swaddling cloth with which the New Testament is wrapped. You will need to undo it or let's say understand it to see the meaning, to be able to properly interpret the New Testament. So, I, I, I see, this is vital because there are so many things that have been given, I told you earlier, English translation. Glory to God. You know, I often say this, where scripture is misinterpreted, oftentimes, a major truth is lost when it's misinterpreted. Are, and I said last night, for example, don't forget that one, that you don't build a theology on excesses. Now, we, we can correct excesses. We should correct excesses. But don't build a theology on it such that the understanding we have of the concept is in the correction of the excess. No, 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 no. Usually, you will take the virility and the truth out of it. So watch this. So oftentimes, like I said, when a scripture is misinterpreted, a major truth is lost. When I got saved, you know, one of the things that kept us in check as believers 
Though always kept us in check. He's a raptor. Why are you laughing? If the rapture didn't keep you in check, you are not really saved. The rapture will keep you in check. Because every time you say, what if you do this and Jesus will come? Ah, the truth is you will still do it. <laughs> I had a friend then. He used to be very, I mean, he looked very sanctimonious. So we used to stay in the same bed. He stepped, he stepped up, I stepped down. So I told him, I said, I will not leave this bed. Because I'm told that Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. I don't like thieves somehow. Jesus is. So I said, when you are leaving, I will hold your leg. I can't suffer here and suffer in eternity. You know, uh, people, they, they say all sorts. And you know, th- those things have so been believed. And you, you remember th- this last time we had the COVID and we had the, what you call the, the, the lockdown. So people came up with theories. Anytime there's something that happens in the world, theology is just imagined. So we came up with theories. Someone called me and said, um, said, I respect your interpretation of scripture. I respect it. I said, say what you want to say. I said, this thing happens. This thing. This, uh, the way the COVID is, the vaccination. And the fact that they are restricting people. I see the signs of the answer. Yeah. I said, who is the Antichrist? He said, for now. It's pointing to, he mentioned someone's name that you know that I know. And we're all trying to be like, financially speaking. You are the one that knows what you are thinking. I don't know what you are thinking. <laughs> and I said, how? So he said, you know all these things? I said, do you know how many Antichrists in the Bible? I said, no. The Antichrist in the Bible is predicted. The first Antichrist in the Bible came. Hey, hey. That's the Antichrist. So there were several Antichrists. But there was one who was a Christ, became an Antichrist. I said, ah. I said, Saul, the king, was first Christ, then Antichrist. I said, I'm not getting you. You can't. Because you have been defaming other people. In my own time, I've seen many antichrists that come and go. They have gone. I was told at the point was Pope John Paul II. That the man is so quiet that he carries the mark of the beast. So every time he does it on people's head, they say he's putting mark on their head. Hey, that's how the man died. Antichrist was. Then later on, they say Saddam Hussein. When he began the Gulf War, he said, this is the, this is the war that will close the ages. The Third World War. Third World War. Then I said, where are you getting me from? Jesus said, there will be wars and rumors of war. If you have not seen enough war in your Bible, the Bible is full of war. So which one? Then when Saddam Hussein lost his own, we were looking for another Antichrist. He calmed down for a while. But in the middle of that, I think before Saddam was saying, I was told there was Juan Carlos, called King Juan Carlos of Spain. And the reason they said because he's trained an Air Force man, he's a soldier, and he's also a naval officer, that he's so equipped that he's the one, he will have control over the air, you know, the air, the sea. Everything was just flowing. See, the man died. So look for other antichrists and then they found Osama bin Laden. Said, that is the antichrist. See that one to die. Or he was caught or ran away. No, his own was running. He was running. Then when a black man became the president of America and it was now Obama, Barack Hussein Obama, that's the antichrist. Till he left office. Then when COVID came and then Bill Gates was promoting vaccination, they said, you see, that's the antichrist. They've left him alone for now. Who is the latest one? 
In fact, someone wrote this. A preacher. He said, why would you call anybody goat greatest of all time? He said, that is the Antichrist. I was so glad he mentioned the man from Argentina. Not my own. <laughs> he said, how can you call a human being? I said, what does that mean? He said, no, he's trying to take the place of God. Does God play football? <laughs> if God plays football, you walk in love. You score the goal. He won't tackle you. He will support you to score against him. So he can't be. He will never be the greatest of all time in football. You know. You know. You know. Somebody preached this sermon years back. He told us said, "Why believers must not play football?" No, that was not the title of the sermon. But he was explaining. He said because when you get the ball as a Christian. We're not supposed to deceive people. If you do like this. <laughs> you guys are lucky, right? <laughs> You'll be hearing the word of God. Easy, easy. Do like this. Yeah. You must go, hey. <laughs> Bible says, lie not to one another. You say, I want to play like this, so follow me. <laughs> are you still there? <laughs> so there are things that people have believed. There are people today, they're expecting Jesus to come. Come. That the signs are. The person who said soon and very those people who composed soon and very soon. They went sooner. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming again. He is coming. He is coming. There were songs that people have sung. When you come to collect your people, remember me, O oh Lord. Remember me. How is that praise worship? Will you be ready when the Lord shall come? Will you be ready when the Lord shall come? I will be ready, ready. Ready. Ready when the Lord shall come. I will be ready, ready. I will be ready. I will be ready when the Lord shall come. Oh, when the death go marching in. Oh, when the death go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in the number. Oh, when the death go marching in. Brethren, are you a saint? <laughs> We had another one that we used to sing to. This was a very funny one. You have the, you know, you guys are so lucky now. You can do your hair and look good. Then you hear someone's like, why would you change the air that God gave you? Then you go to Romans 1, changing what, oh my God. You have the, keep on palming your hair. Keep on wearing your jeans, sister. Jesus is coming back. Praise worship song. Keep on wearing makeup. Keep on. And you're in the service and they are singing for you. Jesus is coming back again. <laughs> and a lot of people assume. One day Jesus is going to come here. Yeah. We assume that years back, it must be 95. I have had my birthday, my birthday party. So I told a brother to share. We called him Bishop. He's probably watching me or he watch it one day. You know, I love you, right? But you know, I really love you. But he was my disciple. So I asked him to share. I didn't know where he had gone to. So he came. May 11th, my birthday. I said, share. 
So that's how we started. Brethren, let us be watchful on my birthday. With your love rise that we struggle to put together. You want people to lose their taste, sense of taste. He said, brethren, let's be careful. He said, just this year, say a man died, and when he came back, oh, I said, God. Whenever that happens, the next statement, you are in trouble. That the man said in 1995 that Jesus wanted to come two times. Two. But every time he came like this, He still saw Christians at Stanford Bridge. <laughs> Believe us, though. Yes. Red devil. <laughs> then he kept coming. He came first and said, hey, Michael, what do you think you're He came back, went back. He took her some time. Maybe he had siesta. Then he came back. He said, ah, they don't, have, they don't appear ready at all. So Jesus now told the guy who died who rose again. He said, I'm coming the third time. Whether or whether. It's. Whether you are ready or you are not ready. That's like a kidnapper. <laughs> I am coming. I was so upset. Because we had bought seven up for the brethren. On my birthday. My birthday. As soon as it was done, I just got there and said, I was nonsense. I encourage people to eat their rice. The brethren are interesting. <laughs> brethren will cry and they will see it too. <laughs> have you noticed when you have retreats, convention, people are saying, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, I hunger, I'm still that little boy, I'm still that little girl. They will see it two rounds. People will cry at the cemetery. And they'll show up at the reception. Then the same people say, Mommy, don't go! Mommy, don't go! At the party. <laughs> you better live your life. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I just said, No, say, go to, what did you just say on my birthday? So there are so many things around that. Unfortunately, it's because of scriptures that have been mismangled, cut and paste from nowhere to nowhere. If we, if we stayed with the context of the words, we we'll never have come up with that theory of Jesus showing up in the sky, then grabbing what he can grab. Usually, when it comes to church, the pastor is going to be there. That's why I left the people. <laughs> the pastor will be there. The choir, usually, they don't go anyway. <laughs> they don't, those ones, no one person will go. But people have offense. Sometimes the reason is because there are people in the choir, they have asked staff, and they said no. So they think they cannot make it. <laughs> so you have all sorts of rapture. The answer is on pastors. They, they used to draw Pastor Chris Okoti and Pastor Philip Jordan. They will always miss the rapture. You will know they are, you will know they are the ones because the air cuts and the jerry curls. You don't know what I'm saying. They are blessed. You know, the people like Archbishop in that you will see them missing the rapture in the cartoon. With Isaac Bada, I say, people like this will be left preaching after Christ has come to take his own. 
So we ask them, okay, what will not happen in the plane? Said, well, the pilot may be born again. The co-pilot is not. So the co-pilot will try to land the plane. What if we do are born again? Ah. <laughs> that was a crash. But you told us that nobody is going to die. They will not die though. They will be, this thing is so confusing. They will be feeling the pain of the dead, but they will not be dying. <laughs> then the Antichrist will show up, then they'll be giving out mark of the beast. 666. Six, six. So you collect six, you say, uh, if you collect six, 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 that's the end though. So you will do your best not to collect. They will be chasing you all over Lagos. They say, stop there, stop there, stop there. No, I don't want it back. <laughs> hold it, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We don't hold you. I told someone, I said, this is, this is not a joke. If you bring Mark of the Beast to Nigeria, we'll sort it out. <laughs> we'll sort it out. Say, oh boy, write my name. I'm mocked. You just put my name, I have the mark, but there's no mark. Then some people will do the fake one. Say, I got the mark. Even at the Christ will be confused. <laughs> when we are done, <laughs> then you can have a cousin walking for you and say, oh boy, I, I, I'm more yard now. So don't worry, come inside, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> this country, we will make the Antichrist confused. <laughs> Are you still there? What a joke of a doctrine. That's why we are all laughing. Doesn't make any sense. Matthew 24. Usually, it's a wrong interpretation. There's this teaching that says God is so fed up with the world that he's just looking for a time to throw a time bomb. Bang, go back, go back, go, go, go. Fed up. He has set some time bomb around the world. He's just waiting. You are going to press the button. <laughs> and that's because we got the Bible wrong. Really wrong. Matthew 24. Are you there? Are you in church? Is at this point, if you want to sleep, please sleep. So you hear something in the middle. All right? Now look at it. Verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall this, when shall these things be? When and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, there's a usual assumption of what the authors or the writers or the speakers said. That he did not say. Let's look at two texts. Put your hands in there. <clears throat> look at Mark. Mark 13. The same story. Verse 2. Sorry, verse 4. Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? What is he talking about? Look at verse 2. Start from verse 1. As he went out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, So where were they? Never forget where they were. All right? Let's read it together. Verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, let's go. One of his disciples said to him, Master, see what manner of stones, what building are here. Hold on. He's describing what? Okay. All right, good. Look at verse 2 together. Let's go. Jesus answering said to him, See thou this great building. There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Is it making sense? Look at Luke. That's impressive. Look at Luke. Luke 
21. Verse 7. They asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? What sign will be when these things shall come to pass? So what were they talking about? They were, again, verse 1 through to verse 5. Let's take verse 5 together. And as some spake of what? How it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said. Let's take 6 together. As for these things which you behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So if they ask you, what was the conversion about? Is it about what? The temple. That was what initiated the conversation. Go back to Matthew 24. Learning something? You learning something, guys? Matthew 24. Again, in verse 1. But Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign? This is what gets people off. The sign of your coming and of the end of the world. The sign of your coming. Now, Mark says, when will these things be fulfilled? That this building will come down. Look when and how. Now, Matthew Bring something else in. Your coming and the end of the world. So pay very good attention. Very good attention. Now, the assumption is that they are talking about the rapture or call it the second coming. Number one, there was nothing called second coming here. And there is no text of scripture that speaks about a second coming. The closest that looks like it is Hebrews 9, 8, and we're going to get there, which is talking about his resurrection. The second time. Hebrews 9, 28, sorry. The second time. We'll see that as we continue to study. So Christ wants, okay, to bear the sins of many, to, to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Okay, we see all that. Now, there's an assumption that they were talking about rapture. Now, it's not possible that they were talking about your rapture or a second coming. Because first and foremost, these guys were not even expecting him to die. So, if they were not expecting him to die, they were not expecting... Not even a resurrection. Talk less of a rapture. Are you following this? When he died, they were shocked. They were stunned. Ha! Ah. When he rose from the dead, they didn't first believe. So it's not possible that they were discussing rapture. It was not in their mind. It was not in the conversation at all. The conversation again was about the building of the temple. The building of the temple. Let's see the phrases coming of the Lord. Look at Matthew 10. The same book of Matthew. Matthew 10. You learning something? I didn't hear you. Learning something, guys? Matthew 10. 23. And when they persecute you in the city, this city, flee to another, for verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be gone. That's impressive. 
Jesus is saying they won't have gone through the seed of Israel before he came. That's no rapture. Not at all. Now, what we call rapture, rapture is Jesus Christ is returning from somewhere, from a trip. He's gone to heaven for 2,000 years. It's always 2,000 years. So he's coming back. to he, He's coming to take his church away. And we're going to a glorious place called heaven. There we shall be forever. In 3 Corinthians 5, 5, there's nowhere in the Bible where you're going to read it. Now, look at another text. Matthew 24 and 34. When Jesus spoke the words of Matthew 24, he said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Are you here? Now, look at verse 35. Slowly. Let's read it slowly. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Now, pause. Did you notice that the writers, whether it is Peter, the writer of Hebrews, they talk about heaven and earth passing away. Now, if what you think is a destruction of the earth, then that makes a lot of confusion. Because it will therefore assume that God lives in heaven, right? And then we live on earth. So people go to heaven when they die. So if heaven and earth will pass away, that means God is going to destroy his own bedroom too. He's just upset with everybody. <laughs> but listen, and I've taught you this one, I've taught you this one over time, that when you say heaven and earth is a codified language of the temple, it's temple that is called heaven and earth. We see all of that. Are you here? Shall pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Look at Matthew 16 and 28. That expectation of Jesus coming to take the church away is false hope. You hear me? Is false hope. The hope is built on wrong interpretation of the scriptures. Matthew 16, 28. Are you still there? Come on. Look at it. Matthew 16, 28. Okay. Let's go. Let's take it together. Verily I say unto thee, there be some standing here that shall not taste death. Till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. We've seen the Son of Man coming as they are going about to preach, which happened right in the four Gospels. We've seen the Son of Man coming, it says, when he comes in his kingdom. Now, look at Matthew 26. So, watch this. He said it. To the audience of Matthew 24, he said, they will not pass away till it comes to pass. He said it to his own disciples that uh, those of you standing here, you will see me come. And don't forget, they are not thinking of a second coming. They did not believe, assume, that he was going to die and even be raised from there. So take that away from your thinking. Who's following what I'm saying this morning? Come on. Are we thinking together? Very right, good. Look at Matthew 26. Now, again, he's talking to the high priest. Matthew 26. Look at 63. Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure thee by the living God. Thou shalt tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Let's take 64 slowly together. Let's go. Thou hast said, nevertheless I say unto thee, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's telling the high priest, 
that he is going to see him come. The clouds of heaven refers to what we call the host of heaven. And heavenly assembly. And the high priest saw this in the book of Acts. So, when we talk about the coming of the Lord, the first thing is remove the word second coming. Because the second coming, you may find it in Zephaniah. We'll see that. The second coming can be in Zephaniah. It can be in Isaiah. Right? When you know what the coming of the Lord means, you will not think it's a return. The coming of the Lord is not a returning. Or in Nigerian language, you are going to say, I'm coming. <laughs> That's his coming. <laughs> That's what we call it in Nigeria. He's coming. All right, good. So, therefore, something is definitely wrong. Now, what people have done is to assume in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that Paul and Jesus were saying the same thing. The first thing is, Jesus' audience happened before his death and resurrection. The second thing is, Jesus' audience did not know he was going to die. Jesus' audience did not even believe he was going to be raised from the dead. So, to do join, join, or copy and paste is wrong. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is clear. Now let's take it again. In Matthew 24, what was Jesus discussing again? The temple. The destruction of the temple. Right? Come on. That was what he was talking about. And if you read further, that destruction is going to happen by an enemy army that will invade Jerusalem. So he said, if you are on the mountains, don't come back home. Oh. Don't say, I want to come and rescue my phone. Just run. He said, two shall be on the field. One shall be taken away. And we assume the one being taken away is taken by the Lord. No, it's taken by the enemy. So that rapture, if that rapture should happen to you. And in Matthew 24, Jesus used the time of Noah. The floods took people away in judgment. Those who remain were in Noah's ark. So left behind. Oh, you know about it? <laughs> I love the men who wrote the book. I love them, but I don't love what they wrote. Because <laughs> it's not true. In the Old Testament, if we have time to look at it in the study, but we've done it in one of our studies, I think it's, um, um, I'll tell you the teaching. The people taken away are taken away by judgment. Those who remain are called a remnant, not by number, but by the fact that they remained. Those who remain are saved. Those who are taken away are in captivity. So it's a wrong reading of scripture. So again, Jesus is discussing the temple, right? Come on. So how is what's where we go? Just relax. He's discussing the temple. And they are discussing the temple with Jesus and the signs where those things will happen. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That you sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So, what is Paul talking about? Temple? He's talking about believers who have gone to be with the Lord, who are asleep. Or let's put it in grammar, who died. So he says, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with this word. Jesus is discussing the destruction of the temple. Paul is talking about the resurrection of the saints. Pay attention to the details. Don't take one and join the other one. Jesus said his own coming will be fulfilled by the destruction of the temple. That will be a sign. And he said those who are listening to him will see it come to pass. Paul is talking about the resurrection of the saints. Are they related? Yes, but not the way many teach it. Neither of them is discussing the famous rapture doctrine. None. So, go back to Matthew 24. Are you in church? You sure about that? Wow. What then shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Let's hold on to the word coming. We'll see that one later on. Let's look at the phrase end of the world. Now, again, like I said earlier on, we have made the writers of the Bible English. So when you say end of the world, it means the world is coming to an end. Or let's put it properly, the world will be destroyed. That's not what he's talking about. Not at all. Now, notice again that the conversation was about the building. The temple. So let's now do a community reading of the Bible. What are the things that Jesus said about the temple? Go to John 2, quickly. In John 2, quick one. Are you still there? Come on, guys, are you still there? In John 2, Jesus entered into the temple. Then he saw what is popularly called the Gentiles' court, where people were buying and selling sacrifices or temple sacrifice items. Then, or like the movies that we watch, where Jesus seems upset, he brought out a whip and whipped everybody, and he's so upset. No. We found out that when you read Mark's account, Luke's account, Matthew's account, and John's account, he actually healed the sick. He taught and explained what he was doing. So the action of driving people out of the temple was an illustration. Now, look, look in John 2, because of our time, I'll just summarize it for you. In John 2, I know you've heard me teach this before. In John 2, when he said, my father's house, you have turned it into a house of merchandise. He called that temple his father's house. Now when he said that, Luke told us and Mark that he taught and Matthew and he healed the sick. Now I told you that last year that what he did was to fulfill something in Isaiah 56 where he allowed, he brought in the outcast. Isaiah 9, he brought in the outcast to be a part of the temple. So the healing of the sick there was to welcome those who are outcasts into the temple. So pause there. We've done this explanation before. Now, as he began to teach, Isaiah and the prophets had spoken about God's temple that will have all the nations in there. We're going to get that in the afternoon. All the nations will be there. So in Matthew, Mark 11, 17, it says, My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. There is no building that can take all nations. And there he refers to Isaiah 56 and 7. Pay attention. So if you look at all the text, he was explaining the text as he was illustrating it. 
That, look, this temple, this um, Gentiles court, where people sell and buy, it restricts the Gentiles from being fully accepted in this temple. He explains that. So we got to a point in John 2. They now asked him a question. Now, listen carefully to this so that you get this very quickly. Are you in church? Go to John 2. So in 16, take these things and make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Let's take 17 together. Uh Uh-huh, let's go. Disciples, remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house, I didn't up. Now, now look at the response of the Jews. So that's how you know what was going on. Let's take it together. Then answer the Jews, "Uh uh-huh, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that you what? Pay attention. Okay, okay, what is the sign? Remember, disciples also asked him for what? A sign. What sign? What could he have said that they were asking for a sign? A saying that this house will be a house for all nations. They knew that it couldn't have been this physical building. Because from prophecy, God was going to build a temple of all nations. So by Jesus putting a claim to it, they said, okay, tell us what is the sign that the prophecies of the Old Testament books are going to come to pass. What is the sign? Remember in Matthew 12, they asked him for another sign. So show us the signs. He said, there's no sign that will be given you. You are an adopted and evil generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was in the heart of the earth, three days and three nights, sorry, uh, the belly of the whale, so the son of man will be the earth of the earth. And then, as Jonah went to preach, the son of man would also announce. So they said, what is the sign? He gave them the sign of his death, the sign of his burial and resurrection. So these guys, so every time they're asking about a sign, is a sign of a fulfillment of something said in the scripture. Just follow what I'm saying this morning. Come, let me see your hand. That's the sign. Now, I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. Not of them were talking about the resurrection. The closest is Matthew 12. Heart of the earth. You'll probably just switch it up. But look at this John 2. Jesus now further said to them in John 2, he said, destroy these temples. Can you see it? Can you see it? Destroy these temples. Now pause. What did he tell his disciples in Matthew 24 was going to happen? This temple will be what? Destroyed. Pay attention now. There should be a buzzer going off now. Pam, 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 pam. Destroy this temple. After three days, I will raise it up again. Now, in Matthew 24, were they talking about destruction of the temple? Huh? Mark 13. Luke 21. Come on, guys. Good. In John 2, was he also talking about the son of the temple? Huh? Now. So, he said, destroy this temple. After three days, I will raise it again. Now, what did he raise? Is it his physical body or the body of Christ? Come on, talk to me now. No, both. <laughs> so the raising of his physical body was a pointer to what? The body of Christ. So the resurrection of the body of Jesus is a pointer to God building the temple. So we have two signs now. We have the signs of the coming down of the temple. We have the signs of the death of Jesus' body. So the death of Jesus' body signaled the end of that physical temple. The resurrection of his body signaled 
the building of a new tabernacle. Let me see how you're following this. Pay attention to it. Both conversations are interlinked. What is the sign? This temple is coming down. And I'm building another one. Now the disciples were a bit confused. But when he rose from the dead, they remembered. They now understood that he was talking about the temple of his body. Now pay attention to what after three days. So in John 2, is in the temple. What did Jesus call the temple? Huh? My father's house. Come on, guys, are you here? Remember in John 4, when he was talking to the woman, and he was talking about the mountain, and the woman said, to mountain, do we worship God? Jesus said, worship the father. So put that in mind. In John 14 and verse 1, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Look at verse 2, John 14. In my father's house are many. Now, what did he call his father's house in chapter 2? What? Move quick, come on. What? So, can we change John 14 to 2 in God's temple? Huh? There are many rooms. I go to prepare a place. So where I am, there you may be. Now, in John 14, you must get this one. When he says, I go and I will come. Right? Uh Uh-huh. I'll take you to myself. So where I am, is that the coming of the Lord? Is that the coming of the Lord? So that coming of the Lord is his resurrection. Right? Come on. Was that what he told the high priest? That you will see the Son of Man coming. Right? With the cows of heaven. And that's the church. So, the coming of the Lord in John 2, John 14, is to build a temple. A house, household of God. Jews, Gentiles, slave, free, great and small. We've done this study before. Are you here? What will be the sign? The sign will be his death. What other sign? The destruction of that physical temple. Heaven and earth will pass. Because heaven is where the holiest of all is. That's what they call heaven. Temple. is where other priests and men are. So heaven and earth is usually called the temple. It will pass. So Jesus is speaking about the building of God's temple. And what will be the sign? The sign is this one will come down. This one will come down. And pay attention. Notice, when he says end of the world, because we must know, what is end of the world? End of the world is not the time the world will come to an end. That's a wrong interpretation. Let me take you through some words and we'll just try to close from there. Are you here? You're learning something, guys. When we say end of the world, what do we mean? Don't forget, heaven and earth refers to the temple. It's a short form or short phrase of the temple. So when we say end of the world, the word end is the word suntelia, S-U-N-T-E-L-I-A. It doesn't mean destruction. End of the world, suntelia, means accomplishment. A finished task. 
Matthew 13 and verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end. Now, why would you use harvest after you sow? Which means that when you sow a seed, what is the end? Is when the seed matures. Suntelia. All right? Look at verse 40. Again, end of the world. Then verse 49. The end of the world, the angel shall come forth and severe the wicked from among the just. Look at Matthew 28 and verse 20. Lo, I am with you, what? Until what? Now pause. This is says community church, so I guess you know this. Look at 18. Matthew 28. All authority? Huh? It giving me where? Now change heaven and earth to temple. Does it make sense? Huh? Oh. <laughs> All right. Heaven and earth, temple, does it fit? Okay. In his resurrection, is he building a house? Huh? A temple? So all authority is given me to build? Come on. To build the house of God? To build a temple? Huh? A physical one? No. So, verse 19. Go and make disciples of what? Because that heaven and earth is for where? Oh. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded. Lo, what? Till what? What's end again? End is the fulfillment of something that I start. Who's following this? Are you following? <laughs> okay, good. Let's see this now. So, end is, they say, lo, I'm with you till we destroy the world together. Nope. So look at that word again. Look at Mark 13. Mark 13, 4. Are you learning something? You should. Mark 13, 4. Tell us, when shall all these things be? What shall be the sign when all these things shall be what? That's the word son tell you. Now, Connect it now. In John 2, it said, this temple will come down, I'll build another one. Right? Come on now. Here, they are saying, when will this temple come down and everything will be fulfilled? Matthew 24, 3 says, end of the world. Look at Luke 4 and 2. Fulfilled. Look for when they were ended. What was ended? When he finished his fast. To complete something is the word Sontelier. Look at verse 13. When the devil had completed all the temptation. So, can we change the word end to completion? Huh? So, when, boss guys, look up, look up, please. When is the sign of your coming and uh, destruction? Uh-huh. What? Last year, camp meeting, what did we call the earth? God's. So, when is the sign of your coming and the completion of what? God's resting place in the earth. The earth is going nowhere. The earth is his respite. Are you here? I'm taking you back to last year. In case you lost your note. And the end completion. Pay attention. We're going to see it now. Acts 21 and 27.
And when the seven days were almost ended, accomplished, completed, Romans 9, 28. So the word end of the world means to complete it. To complete a task. Are you here? Glory to God. Are you okay? Are you okay? To com- it's not to destroy the world. It's to what? To complete the task. Sign of your coming and of the completion of the task. So now, to understand what end means, there's another word that is a contrast. Notice that there are two words that Jesus used in the same Matthew. Look at Matthew 13 and 34. Are you learning something? I want to take away, I want the rapture to rapture from your mind. Is he rapturing? You know, there are believers they tell them, Jesus is coming in the next 10 minutes. They just want to the restroom. Lord, this last nine minutes, I, I just want to help me. Forgive me. I know I was one not to support Chelsea and I did. I know I became a devil. Lord. This, I, you know, people will be so scared. That thing is so scary. There was a year they said Jesus was going to come. I think it was August. So we organized a crusade for that purpose. We had brethren, people coming. The whole place was filled. You know that night, it started to rain. All the signs were there because Matthew 24 says there will be signs in the heavens and the earth. We see what that means now. You just know that it's just Lambert doctrine. That's what it is. It's the heavens and the earth. When I say, ah, somebody in California said, a cloud just from the face of Jesus. Have you seen his face? Yeah, that is Jesus. Just a, a boy was born in Turkey. Then he opened his hand. Then he saw a cross. I'm coming too. <laughs> then a goat just showed up in your church. Ah, I'm coming soon. <laughs> They're just superstitious. But I read your Bible. As not following your yes, signs. Now, <laughs> how did I get here now? Look at Matthew 13, verse 34. All these things spake Jesus to the multiple parables, and without a parable, spake he not unto them. Let's take 35 together. And it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things. Uh huh. From where? Foundation of the world. So we have two words. Foundation and what? End. Can you see it now? So what is the completion is what was tied at the foundation. Matthew 23. And verse 34. 25, sorry. And verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on this right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, you heard the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. If you know what the foundation of the world is, then you know what the end is. Are you here? Are you good? Look at it. Luke 11. Are you learning something? Now? Luke 11 and verse 50. That the blood of all the prophets... Which was shed from where? I'll wait for you. Luke eleven fifty. From where? May be required of this generation. From the blood of who? So Abel was at the foundation of the world. Luke 11 verse 50. Look at John 17. So now watch this. If we use foundation, that means we are discussing a house project. Right? Come on. Good. So, the foundation of the world 
Then look at John 17 and 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me, and with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Look at Ephesians 1, 4. Hallelujah! Learning something? Ephesians 1, 4. According as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless, or without blame before him. Now look at Hebrews 4.3. You mustn't miss this one. Hebrews 4 and verse 3. So in Luke 11, we found out the foundation of the world is in Genesis. Right? Also, in Matthew 13, 34, which is a reference, 35, sorry, a reference to Psalm 78 verse 2, the foundation of the world is also in Genesis. So Genesis is where you will find the foundation of of the world, or let's call it the blueprint of what God is doing at the end of the world. Hebrews 4 and verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into what? Rest. For he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from when? Look at verse 4. For he spoke in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from his work. Now, quick one. Last year, we studied this word rest. And we said this word can also be called rest place. Can you remember? Psalm 75, Psalm 95, Psalm 132. So he says rest place. Isaiah 66. So he's saying here that when we believe, we enter into God's rest place. Can we say enter into God's temple? Come on. Is his rest, his temple? We enter into his temple. Hebrews 12, 22 says, We have come to Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable company of angels. That is the temple. That's the rest place of God. Are you here? Very well. So when we believe, we enter into his rest place, which he spoke of from the foundation of the world. Hebrews 9.26. I'm coming back to this one later on. Hebrews 9.26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, and now once in the end of the world, uh, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He's saying Jesus came at the end of the world. Hallelujah. First Peter 120. Who verily was for then before the foundation of the world that we was made manifest in this last time for you. For then from the beginning. Hallelujah. Revelation 13 8. Whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain. From the foundation of the world. That's also Revelation 17, 8. Now, many translators have put that back. That is, the, the book of life is from the foundation of the world, of the lamb that was slain. So there's no lamb slain at the foundation of the world. Rather, the book of life at the foundation of the world. So we have two words that relate to each other. What's the first one? End of the world. Then what do we have? So, we'll know what, how do we know the end? We see the foundation. So, we've seen also that the foundation of the world describes Genesis. What did God begin in Genesis? You can now see why Jesus' teaching started from Genesis. Where is the plan? What's the plan? What did he begin in Genesis? That is bringing to an end. Learning something here? Are you learning something here? Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Am I expecting the coming of the Lord? Yes, but not his return. 
Am I expecting to come out? Yes, but not his second coming. <laughs> we'll see all that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Are you here? Yeah, come on. Quick, 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 quick. First Corinthians 10. Let's take verse 11 together. Let's go. Now, all these things happen unto them for examples. Hold on. Who are the them? First Corinthians 10, 1. Those who were the fathers of the nation of Israel. So he's saying the things that happened to them in the Exodus happened to them as examples. Two posts in the Greek. Now, let's finish it together. Let's go. And they are written for what? Uh-huh. Upon? Hold on. Who are the them? Who are the them here? Huh? The fathers? Who are the us? Huh? Who is the us there? You. How? Did Paul know you? The us here are the Corinthians. Right? That means when Paul wrote this letter, the end of the world had come. The end of the project. Hallelujah. Are you in church? Are you in church? Look at Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Learning something? Are you learning something here? Hebrews 9. And verse 26. I'll start to close here. Hebrews 9. Let's take it together. Let's go. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation. But now, uh huh, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That means the death of Jesus took place when? At the end of the world. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So the well, the end of the world is the completion of the foundation of the world. So we must find out what is in the foundation? Because the pattern of the foundation takes us to the end. When he said to Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church. He said, I'll build. The word that Jesus used so often, Paul, how built. Why did they use build? Because God's work in the earth is a building. How built? Build. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I give to you the keys of the kingdom. We we'll study a bit of that in the afternoon. Look at Matthew 24. We we'll close on this one. You know, people misread or have misread what he said. And I thank God for Kenneth Hagin, Brother Hagin, who made some of us see this vital fact. They focus on wars and rumors of wars, betrayals. But I tell people oftentimes, there's nothing Jesus mentioned there that had not happened in the Old Testament. Earthquakes. There's nothing he said that is not a regular occurrence in the world. False prophets. False Christ. There are false Christ all over the Old Testament. False Christ after he rose from the dead. But he only gave a sign of the end. Look at verse 14. Let's take it together. And this gospel, Matthew 24. Are you here? Verse 14, let's go. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. Then shall the house 
have been completed. Then is a temple accomplished. So it's the end of the world where it is in all of the world. Hallelujah. You bless this afternoon. Stand to your feet. Lift your hands. Bless this day. We worship you, O God. You're blessed. Lift your hands. Thank you. Oh, bless your name. Sing and thank you. You are part of what God is doing in the earth today. Thank you. Are you part of his building? Part of his house? Are you in his rest place? Lift your hands and thank you. Worship his name. 